morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Thursday, April 27th. And here are some of the stories we are covering. The World Health Organization warns of a dire health crisis in conflict towards Sudan. In the coming weeks, an estimated 24,000 women will give birth, but they are currently unable to access maternal care. The risk of diarrheal disease is high as the water supply is disrupted and people are drinking river water to survive. We will have the latest from Khartoum on the status of the 72-hour ceasefire. Zimbabwe hosts the sixth Transform Africa Summit. Liberia launches a digital address system. A Kenyan parliamentarian wants stay for punishment for sharing compromising photos of partners on social media. South Africa's former ESCOM chief will not name names in the parliamentary corruption probe. All the euphoria of 1994, there's nothing left what we have is collective depression because we're literally in the dark with an ANC government that's really, really not capable of governing. In a conversation this morning with Miss Africa USA 2023 about her plans to visit Africa, those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. The World Health Organization says it is concerned about the occupation of Sudan's public health laboratory by one of the warring parties. During a briefing on Wednesday, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesu said the lab was no longer able to perform its normal diagnostic and reference functions. He also expressed concern that those who occupy the lab could be accidentally exposed to pathogens stored there. Dr. Gabriel Su says an estimated 24,000 women are expected to give birth in coming weeks and are unable to access maternal care. He said the best medicine for Sudan now is peace. The bloodshed we have seen over the past 10 days in Sudan is heartbreaking in a country whose people have already suffered so much in recent years. WHO welcomes the ceasefire agreed between the parties. We urge all parties to fully respect it. Already, the violence has taken a terrible toll on health. On top of the number of deaths and injuries caused by the conflict itself, WHO expects there will be many more deaths due to outbreaks, lack of access to food and water, and disruptions to essential health services, including immunization. WHO estimates that one quarter of the lives lost so far could have been saved with access to basic hemorrhage control. But paramedics, nurses, and doctors are unable to access injured civilians, and civilians are unable to access services. In the capital, Khartoum, 61% of health facilities are closed and only 16% are operating as normal. Many patients with chronic diseases like kidney disease, diabetes, and cancer are unable to access the health facilities or medicines they need. In the coming weeks, an estimated 24,000 women will give birth, but they are currently unable to access maternal care. Vector control programs to prevent transmission of dengue and malaria have had to stop. The risk of diarrheal disease is high high as the water supply is disrupted and people are drinking river water to survive. With nutrition programs suspended, 50,000 children are at real risk and the movement of civilians seeking safety threatens the fragile health system throughout the country. Since the conflict began, WHO has verified 16 attacks on health, causing eight deaths. WHO is also concerned about the occupation of the central public health lab by one of the parties in the conflict. Technicians no longer have access to the laboratory, which means the lab is no longer able to perform its normal diagnostic and reference function. We're also concerned that those occupying the lab could be accidentally exposed to pathogens stored there. WHO is seeking more information and conducting a risk assessment. Power cuts are also threatening to make the few remaining stocks of blood stored in the central blood bank unusable. WHO has stocks of essential medicines, 
blood bags, supplies for surgery and trauma care, waiting for delivery. But we need safe access to do that. As always, the best medicine in this situation is peace. Dr. Tedros Ahenam Gebreyesu is the Director General of the World Health Organization. He spoke Wednesday at a press briefing. Sudan's 72-hour ceasefire was barely hanging by a threat on Wednesday after claims and counterclaims of masterminding jailbreaks that some reports say led to the escape from prison of members of former President Omar al-Bashir's government. Mohamed Anwar, a Sudanese resident of the capital Khartoum, tells me that the atmosphere in Sudan was a bit more peaceful on Wednesday, although there were sporadic shootings. Today I think uh, there is also clashes, but it's a little bit less... Uh than yesterday. Or maybe I belong to my area, there is still I hear bomb and this and that, but I'm not hear about any injuries or death or something like that. So we can say that the ceasefire is holding? No, no, you cannot say it like this. Actually, there is a sort of clashes surrounding certain areas, but it's not belong to the civilians' houses itself. For example, I hear a sort of fighting. Uh, they say the surrounding the military command center, clashes, uh, bombs, sort of small bottle. But I don't know exactly uh, what the result of it. And you hear about also some of troops uh, wrong to the RSF want to uh, to make sort of supply to the troops of RSF in Khartoum, but also also bombed by planes, military planes or fighters, and there is a small clashes here and there, you know, in, in different areas. But generally, until now, what we can say as compared to another day is, uh, for me, for me, maybe yes or wrong, um, yes or right, I think it's better or more safe, something like that, but less quiet, maybe it is exactly the word. But. So what are people doing about, I mean, getting food or water and, you know, the necessity of just to live? What are people doing? There is a differences according to the area. For example, there is an area uh, which is uh, completely shutting down without any support. And uh, there is areas which partially opened for 10 to 20 percent of the services opened. And there is also areas which more than this, maybe reach for 40 to 50 percent or more. Uh, it depends on the area. You know, the capital of Khartoum is very big. It uh, consists of three big cities, Bahri, Durman, and Khartoum itself. So it depends on uh, the area itself. The war is not in the whole town, you know. It's mobile. It depends on the mobility of the forces here and there. But generally, the major problem in the Khartoum now, it will be related to the medical area. What can you tell us about the jailbreak? We understand there was a jailbreak and some people escaped. Actually, there is four prisons which are uh, undergo for attacks, you know. The people who are in the three prisons, they said that three of them, the RSF, they attack the prisons and take the criminals out. But the last one, or the fourth prison, which uh, one of the people are Omar al-Bashir inside of it, and the last the regime, the last regime like Omar al-Bashir and his crew, there is a sort of another uh, story. They say that this is not RSF attack. It uh, belongs to the people who are want to take uh, Omar al-Bashir out of the prison. And they said this troop is special troops related to the, the old regime. Thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you. And please uh, keep safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mohamed Anwar was speaking with us from the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. Zimbabwe is hosting the sixth edition of the continent's prestigious Transform Africa Summit, or TAS, which kicked off on Wednesday in Victoria Falls with over 3,000 local and international guests. VOA Zimbabwe Services Evan Zinica reports. Transform Africa Summit is Africa's leading annual forum, bringing together global and regional leaders as well as digital experts to collaborate on new ways of shaping, accelerating, and sustaining Africa's ongoing digital revolution. TAS is running under the theme 
connect, innovate, and transform. Transform Africa Summit was held for the first time in Kigali, Rwanda in 2013 and culminated in the adoption of the Smart Africa Manifesto document by seven African heads of state in which they made a commitment to provide leadership in accelerating socio-economic development through information and communication technology. In his opening remarks, Zimbabwe President Emerson Munangagwa said in the past, Zimbabwe depended on Germany for e-passports and today the Southern African nation is now producing them locally. A sign that Africa is progressing in ICT. For Africa, when it became independent, to immediately promote science and technology, we somehow looked up to the former organizers. Until recently, we discovered that the first world was built because we focused on science and technology, which we are embracing now ourselves. Zambian President Hakainde Hichilema told the gathering that there is need for Zambia, Malawi and Zimbabwe to work together as they used to be one country. The Zambian leader further noted that Africa should fully embrace ICTs. It is a platform. It is basically our daily threat upon which we must achieve accelerated economic and social development so we can create jobs for our youth. 60% of our population, 1.2 billion or more, are relatively young, under 30 years old. Addressing the same meeting, Malawian President Lazarus Chakwera said Africa's development has for a long time been held back by wars and there is a new scramble for Africa by the West and the East as they fight to control strategic minerals. And so when it comes to the socioeconomic development of Africa, the only way for us to catch up is to take a shortcut. And the only shortcut available for, to us now is technology that allow us to go digital in every second of our economy. Harare-based independent economic commentator Masimba Kuchera, however, said there was not much to write home about. Well, look, I think it's an important getting together of heads of state. Um, I hope it unlocks some of the bottlenecks that we have in terms of trade, in terms of movement. Uh, you still find that in some African countries, you need visas to move from one country to the other. The Zimbabwean government says it came up with an innovation fund in 2018 for financial academic and non-academic citizens interested in innovate prototypes. It says the innovation hubs were created at tertiary institutions to support the country's digital economic agenda. Evans Zeninga for VOA News, Washington. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, April 27th. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The former head of South Africa's national energy firm, also known as ESCOM, has refused to name the minister and politician who allegedly tolerated its corruption. Andre Duruto, who was answering lawmakers' questions by video link due to death threats against him, cited security and legal risks. Vicky Stark reports from Cape Town, South Africa. A couple of months after Andre de Reiter alleged someone tried to poison him by putting cyanide in his coffee at his office, he engaged in an interview with a local news channel. His appearance Wednesday before Parliament's Standing Committee on Public Accounts stems from what he revealed then about the level of corruption in ESCOM. Dorato told the committee in an affidavit this week that in his estimation the company loses about $54 million per month to corruption. He called the number a conservative estimate based on losses that came to his attention. Despite being offered parliamentary privilege Wednesday, Dorato wasn't willing to name names of the politician he alleges is involved in the graft, nor the government minister he claims tolerates it. However, he didn't object or correct the statement by Alf Lies, a member of parliament representing the main opposition Democratic Alliance. It has become patently 
uh, evident to me, certainly, that the minister who made the comment about letting other cadres or certain people feed was indeed Minister Gordon. Praveen Gordon is the Minister of Public Enterprises under which ESCOM falls. He has previously admitted to having a conversation with Dureta about criminality at the power company, but has denied saying corruption should be tolerated. When pressed Wednesday, Dureta said Gordon knew the name of the politician involved. I think that is a question that, that uh, will be able to be answered by um, Minister Gordon. He, he, he should be able to answer that question. To my recollection, I did mention it to him and uh, he, would, uh, he would be best placed to respond to that. Dureta complained of Gordon being extremely involved in ESCOM's operations and of bypassing him, his chief operating officer and head of generation. The parliamentary committee's chairperson, Nkuleko Hlengwa, was unimpressed with Dureta's testimony, saying they were still at square one as he revealed nothing more than in his television interview. Hlengwa said they would be calling him again. Dureta's appearance came on the eve of Freedom Day when South Africa marks 29 years since the first democratic election after decades of apartheid rule which oppressed people of colour. Analyst Professor Amanda Ghos of Stellenbosch University said the level of corruption in South Africa is sad. I mean, there's nothing to celebrate. We are doing really, really badly. I mean, the, you know, we, we, what we're seeing is the process of deconsolidation of democracy, of backsliding of democracy. For all the euphoria of 1994, um, there's nothing left. What we have is collective depression because we're literally in the dark uh, with a, um, an ANC government that's really, really not capable of governing. South Africa's economy has been dealt a massive blow in recent months by daily rolling blackouts, which critics blame on mismanagement of ESCOM. Vicky Stark, VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa. The Liberian government has launched a national digital postal address system known as ND Pass. The government says the move fulfills a resolution passed by the Universal Postal Union that mandates all member states to initiate an updated address system within their countries. As Rita Gilabwe Duo reports from Monrovia, the country is now transitioning from a manual address system to a digital one. Liberia's Post and Telecommunications Minister Kupokura says that the national digital and postal addressing system will make it easier to locate people for quick and efficient service delivery. For example, the post over here, sometimes we take packages from here, you go to Singa, you want to look for John Brown from one corner to another. So sometimes you, you have uh, two, three persons with the same name. You start knocking somebody's door and they know that that not me, somebody else. This one will help to solve those kind of problems. Aside from just easily locating people, Minister Kura says the system will promote other basic social services and attract investors to Liberia. We will have the banking institution to work along with us. The health facilities in Liberia are all captured. So that even if you are somewhere you want to know the health facility that is closer to you, you can go to this address. The National Postal Digital Addressing System, or ND Pass, was made possible through a public-private partnership agreement signed between the government of Liberia and Snowcoat, an IT-based international company. According to Snowcoat's chief executive officer, Sessinam Dagadu, the system that was designed for Liberia is one of the most advanced digital systems in the world. He says the app works in any environment because it does not depend entirely on an Internet connection. Across the world, people have had addressing systems for a long time. But the Snookwood addressing system has been designed to give every advantage possible in building an addressing system in the 21st century to the Liberian people. It works offline. Of course, you need the Internet to download it. But once you've downloaded it, you don't need the Internet to use it. It means I could take it to my grandmother's house in the village where they don't have any Internet access and the addressing system still works. This system covers all 110 square kilometers of the Liberian land and coastal territories. And so everybody in Liberia. For his part, the chief operation officer of Snow Coat, Derek Laish, says that, that the partnership between his company and the Liberian government will empower youth to acquire new skills to create their own jobs. 
we have a PPP arrangement with the government and we're looking to be able to transfer the technology, transfer the know-how, transfer the system that we have developed and honed over a decade to the Liberian people. The government says it will institute measures that will mandate every Liberian to make use of the national digital addressing system. For Daybreak Africa, I am Rita Jabwedou in Morove. In Kenya, a female member of parliament says she will introduce an amendment to strengthen the punishment clause of the country's Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act. Meili Odiambo says the change would allow life imprisonment for sharing on social media a compromising video or photo of one's partner. This comes as the practice is becoming prevalent in Kenya and elsewhere in Africa. In fact, the Liberian government announced Monday this week that they had arrested a man they believed to be a notorious scammer. They said in a statement that the man would establish romantic relationship with women, record their intimate moments, and then use the recordings to blackmail them. Parliamentarian Odiambo says the practice is detrimental to Kenya's conservative tradition, and the amendment she's sponsoring, if passed, would send a strong message to future extortionists. I'm proposing that uh, they should be jailed for up to life. Why life sentence? Why? Well, because you actually destroy somebody's life will do that. We come from a very conservative community where sexual issues are very sacrosanct. You don't share them, you don't talk about them in public. And when you share somebody's private sexual moments, whether it's real or whether it is not real or presumed, because there is even a debate about whether that actually relates to the person it's supposed to be referring to. But when you do something like that, you actually destroy people's lives. I know somebody whose children actually had to drop out of school because of the intimidation and harassment they had to go through after leaked photos. So you you have actually destroyed somebody's life. So the sentence should be suitable to what you have also done. People might say, well, one person would not take a photo of another person unless there is some agreement between them. The fact that you have allowed you to take my photo doesn't mean I've allowed you to share my photo. That's why in the Constitution we have a right to privacy. And the right to privacy means basically that when I'm having an intimate moment with you, I'm not having an intimate moment with the world. Otherwise, I would actually go and shoot pornography. Because when I shoot pornography, I'm making it accessible to the world. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Meili Odiambo is a Kenyan member of parliament. She was speaking with us from the capital, Nairobi. Miss Africa USA 2023 winner, Snit Demini says uh, she intends to go to Africa during her 12-month reign to educate its people about the potential of children with special needs. The 24-year-old senior neuroscience student also wants to help demystify long-held beliefs on the continent that such children are a burden on society. The reigning beauty queen from Eritrea spoke to viewers in Nisha's honor about her desire to help those with Down syndrome and a lifelong dream to build a school for special needs children in Africa. I have been chosen uh, to become the Miss Africa USA of 2023. Um, because it was God's will um, and because I think my platform was unique and different and I did really put all my heart into it and I am glad that Miss Africa USA was able to see that and um, give me this title. Okay, so uh, let's go to what you wrote on the Miss Africa USA official page and that's because you have a sister uh, who is uh, living with, you know, Down syndrome. And here's what she said, and I quote, uh, just like we don't expect a handicapped person in a wheelchair to go up the stairs, but instead we build wheelchair accessible buildings, I'd love to make adjustments to our current curriculums and make them successfully achievable uh, for children with special needs, end of quote. Let's first begin with you demystifying uh, the long-held beliefs around children with Down syndrome and uh, what this change you're hoping to have would, would have? So I'd say back home, starting where I came from, um, children with special needs are seen more as a burden, as um, maybe children who have been cursed, uh, maybe as not a really good blessing into the family. And um, I realized that once I had my sister step in into my life, 
I became um, more kind uh, towards children. My approach towards them changed completely. And I saw today I am here to, with you and I am the Miss Africa USA 2023 because of her. So clearly she has been a blessing. That was Miss Africa USA 2023, Snit Demini speaking with viewers initial anno. I am James Barton, Washington, saying have a great day and please be safe.